Welcome to Just Want a Quilt, a research podcast coming out of Tulane University Law School, where we explore all kinds of things, stories about quilting, tools, field trips, maybe some famous quilters stop by, and of course, a little bit of copyright thrown in just for fun. This is Elizabeth Townsend Gard, your host, and I'm a law professor at Tulane University Law School and a faculty fellow at the A.B. Friedman School of Business at Tulane. And I just want a quilt. So we have a famous person with us today. Rob Appel joins us from Man Sewing. Um, he talks to us about his life and his philosophy and working with Missouri Star Quilt Company. And it's awesome. Oh, certainly. Uh, my name is Rob Appel. And I'm sitting in lovely Morro Bay, California right now. And, and that's, that's where I live as well. I right. travel a lot. So, I, yeah. I'm and then you get to go home. And home you, studio. Did you grow up there too? Mostly between Ventura and uh, Morro Bay. Oh, coast cool. Coast. Yeah. yeah. Central very Coast. Cool. Yeah. Very cool. Um, okay, cool. What's your first memory of someone sewing or quilting in your life? Oh, gosh. Um... I was hoping that that would just jump into my head, but it didn't. Uh, but I remember sewing some of my first projects uh, was was uh, curtains for a Volkswagen van. Yeah. Oh, no. Okay. Sorry. Now that you said it, boom, there comes the flash. It just took me a second to warm up. Yeah. I used to make little, um, I would call them tunics for action figures, but we can call oh, them you dolls. Did? Let's, let's, yeah, let's for, your, for, the, for like your like G.I. Joes or whatever dolls exactly. you had. And now I'm going to bust you bad because I can Why? see your studio, but the, the audience doesn't, maybe they know, no, but you've got some Toy Story. Toy Story. Back there. Yeah. yeah. Star- Woody, Woody right. is sitting on Woody. the shelf back there behind you. Now, Woody's now, a Woody, big part of our life. Yeah. Huge well, thing. I'm glad you said big part because I think he's a 12 inch, right? Yeah. He's a, like he's he's a tall. size one. Yeah. He's, he's a real dog. He's, he's, yeah. He's a real guy. So my action figures were the Star Wars and G.I. Joe action uh-huh. figures that were three and a half. Oh, man. Tall. So I was That's hard to make sew. the tunics. Amen. Right, right, right. So right. I made these little like pullover tops so that they could be customized. And then my favorite thing yeah. was there was one specific character uh-huh. from Star Wars. He worked on the Death Star, if you're yeah. following along. He had that wonderful big rounded helmet. Uh-huh. And I wanted to make him a face mask. Ah, and I would take nice. my mother's vitamin D caplets. Uh-huh. I would poke a hole with a sewing needle. Yeah. I would squeeze out the vitamin E. Yeah. I would then taste, take elastic thread yeah. and make a strap. That is very because hard that, to do. Right. And That's it would only like last tiny. a couple days. Yeah. Oh, because it was a gel, the gelatin yeah, it, cap. It, so you have to yeah, make them it again. Would dry out. Yep. Interesting. Yep. I would, I would make these little face masks. So that's actually my very first sewing memory. So like, that's yeah, really I, cool. I, that's amazing. Yeah. And was Star Wars, like, a thing for you? Like, it was for my husband. Like, it was like he loved Star Wars. His room was Star uh, I, Wars. It was, it's funny that you said a thing. It, I, I'm sorry. I still. Think the thing. The, the thing. thing. Yeah, it's still and, a thing. Uh, Same and it here. It is still a thing. And, yeah, my kids are also enjoying the Star Wars and the remakes, and we absolutely love it. Yeah, it's a whole thing. That's cool. Um, hey, and your mom, had, uh, your mom had a quilting shop. Did, am I right? Yes. You so, are correct, yeah. Did, how old were you when she had the quilting shop? Did you grow up with it or was it something a later in life thing or? No, it's a really cool story. And a lot of people, even in our community, still think that I'm the kid that they saw growing up in yeah. the quilt shop. <laughs> that was out your double? <laughs> well, no, what, what it really was, was a woman named Sylvia Cook started uh-huh. the Cotton Ball in 1969. Uh-huh. Her daughter was Debbie Linker, or is Debbie Linker. Uh-huh. And so Debbie Linker had two sons, Jason and Eric, and they are just about two years older than I am. Ah, they so were the little kids that grew they up. They were the little kids. The fabric store. Interesting. But what happened was I went off to college uh-huh. in uh, Oregon. I went up to Central Oregon uh, to bend and goofed around. And, um, and at that period of time, my mom became the manager at the Cotton Ball mm-hmm. that was still owned by the Linker family. A few years later, she had the opportunity to purchase it, and that's how I got my got first it. Job so when you were in college, when she p- purchased the, I mean, you were grown up by the time well, she purchased it. I, I'm not grown sure up if ish. You were grown up yet? Yeah, yeah. If we can, if we can be careful with that term, please. It's a you know. Right. Do you ever feel but, grown up? That's the thing, right? You know yeah. what? I do way too often. It's, yeah. a, it's been part of that stress and struggle we were talking about right before we started the role. It's true. With, the obligations you know? of life make you feel like a grown up. It's true. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. Yeah. I have these wonderful teenagers I love, but man, we are getting really close to like college age. Really? Right yeah. Mine is too. Mine's 15. So we're I've got like. A 15 and a 13. Yeah. yeah. So you get it. It's, oh, interesting. The growing up is so cool, but wow. I yeah. keep, you know. My husband and I keep practicing. We're like we call ourselves pre-empty nesters. We're getting trying to get used to the idea of the kid not being around, you know. And then one day she's like, "Can I? Do you think I might take a gap year and stay home?" I'm like, "Yes, <laughs> like totally. <laughs> like you're welcome to do that." <laughs> but oh, she we won't. Have a wonderful community you know? college program in our in our area, and we believe both of our kids will attend there the first two years because it's um, pro bono. It's free of charge. That's uh, great for the kids that are. Local. That's so great. That's so smart. Right? Yeah. Yeah, and not not saddling um, either the family or the kids with debt is so important at this point, you know? I'm, okay, so I'm a huge Dave Ramsey, debt-free lifestyle guy. So yeah. Dave Ramsey's a radio host, you know, that talks about going out there and living. He says, live like God and grandma's way. So if you can't pay cash for it, don't buy it. Oh, interesting. It's actually pretty pretty life-changing. Yeah. And, um, and we also are a really strong family family. Like, I live next door to my in-laws. That's so on cool. Purpose. On purpose. Yeah, and my, yeah, and, and my, <laughs> not uh, accident. I bought the house next door. Yeah, no, this is not like I live in the backyard of my in-laws. <laughs> I actually purchased a different property next door to my in-laws. Very nice. Um, and my parents only live maybe 30 minutes away. And like I, we were just talking about, I worked with my mom for a bazillion years. She got me my start in quilting. Yeah. And so we're really a tight knit group and family. And we believe in that whole, it takes a village. You know, yeah, concept. it does. So, I love it. That's, yeah, really so I great. guess I don't have to totally be grown up yet because I live around my parents so they can be the grown ups. It's interesting. And it's I, kind of, um, at least for me, my dad's lived with us for about 10 years. My mom passed away um, about a decade ago and we he came to live with us. And it's so interesting because sometimes, and my husband and I grew up together, so sometimes we're like teenagers, you know, and he's the dad. And sometimes we're the grown ups and he's the kid. Sometimes my kid is the grown up. Like there's a kind of, it's very fluid as to who is being the grown up at the moment and who's the kid. I don't think it's, yeah. um, it's really, it's fun. It's cool. So Yeah, we do a lot of road trips. And now I have the uh, massive car with the eight seat belt so we all can fit in. Wow, but that cool. means I also drive. You do the and driving. So I, I drive, but I've got my father-in-law sitting next to me and my dad behind me and then my <laughs> son, great. you know, in the next row. That back. is so yeah. awesome. That's yeah, awesome. But there's, a lot of, there's a lot of information. I get a lot of assistance. You get a lot of assistance? Uh, yeah, yeah, when yeah. I drive with my dad, I always feel 16 again. I totally feel like a 16-year-old. It's weird. I mean, maybe good. I don't know. So yeah. No, no. My, my, my folks are both great. They give us – they both both sides of the parents give us really great freedoms to – like I said, we all appreciate the fact that we get to live close. Yeah, it's great. Person. It is – it's really it – is, it is a gift because so much – so many families, including ours, is spread out um, just because of the logistics of the world and economics and all of that. So it's a – it's very cool. And you live in a well, beautiful I, place. So Yeah. And, and, and I, you know, like I, I, I promised myself I wouldn't get too emotional, too spiritual. You know, I love these folk, yeah. these conversations and yeah. stuff. But, you know, I travel so much. And you I do. talk to so many folks that are a couple of, or at least a generation older than I, if not two. Yeah. And, and so people are telling me at the end of their time on the planet that they would wish they had nothing more than time with their family. Yeah. Right? Yeah, like, they that's do. You always hear that. That's right. They always say that. Right. Yeah, And then at the same point, we are also learning that life shouldn't be about the destination. I don't want to get to the curtain, That's right? right? It's about, want, it should be about the journey. The journey, exactly. That's right. I hear that all the time because this, this ridiculous project that I've been on for a year, everybody's always like, well, when it, what, when is it going to end? Or what? And I'm like, I don't really care when it ends. <laughs> like, yeah, it's hope, really just about the experience, I, you know? It. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. When I don't enjoy it. And I, I, I interviewed um, Victoria Finley Wolf recently yeah. and she was saying the same thing and she was like she's like well when I stop enjoying it I'll just stop you know like right. that's the point is like you should be doing things that you if you can if you financially can afford to do that that you should be doing the things that you want to do and if you're not enjoying it do something else um so right. I thought that was right. you know interesting I right. get that yeah sure. I, I found myself the last couple of years rushing through the last couple of years to get either back to work or to a different financial state or what is it and, I, and I, again, I am chasing the carrot on the stick. And the faster I run, the further the carrot gets from me. Yeah. And so I'm learning to slow down, take a deep breath, and really enjoy that process of being around my family. Because if that's what I'm going to want at the end of my time on the planet, yeah. then 
I might as well start enjoying it now because I do get to work out of a home studio. And I, like I said, I travel 50% of my month. It's amazing. You, home, your travel schedule, 50%. I looked at your schedule. Your travel right? schedule is insane, right? Right. Oh my gosh. Mm-hmm. Oh What's my, that about? What's that about? Like, are you, in, I mean, that's part of what the, this gig is, I think, for the, and you're, you're quilt famous, right? You're totally, you're like, yeah. a, like you can't walk through quilt festival without a bazillion people mobbing you, right? And so part we, we of like it. You use the term so liberty. Yeah, yeah, so liberty? So you're so liberty? Yeah. Oh my gosh, so that's liberty. ridiculous. Yeah. yeah, so, um, but part of being a so liberty is the travel, which is, I think, really yeah. interesting that that is very much being with your fan base, with people, like that is really important part of this thing. It's not just that you're on YouTube or you do things or whatever. They want you right there with them. Right. I know some people use YouTube because it's actually a nice barrier. You can yeah. you can in, be you can be involved, you can be face to face kind of, but you still have the social media screen right. and you are the person, you- then they're the fan base or the or the the viewers. Right. Like there's a separation. Right. Right. I'm the other side of it. I'm yeah, actually too. not a giant fan of social media. I love it for the resource it can be, but I, I prefer to be in public. I prefer to teach a person hands-on. I prefer to, to give a hug at the beginning and the end of the day. Yeah. And so for me, and I don't know if Jenny don't, I know you interviewed Jenny. Yeah, I did. I don't know if she, I don't know if, if she said this, I haven't got to listen to many of the podcasts, yeah, okay. but, um, um, you know, we are the, both of us are the kind of people that thrive off of being around like, so, so we nice. recharge. So when right. I go on the road and I've learned again to use this over the last couple of years. So, so, but if those people are going to listen to the, everything we say here today, I am what I think coming out of a pretty heavy depression. I hit depression a couple of years ago and started seeing a counselor and all kinds of things. Cause I was just literally overwhelmed by everything that was happening. That's really interesting. I was taking it too seriously yeah. and I was trying to do too much that I couldn't control. And yeah. I, again, I was just beating myself up, my own worst critic. Yeah, I get and, it. And, and that people, and that, the thing that's so, I appreciate you sharing, I'm sure you shared it elsewhere, but I think that people would look at you and say, how could you ever, how could that be, right? Mm-hmm. Like, you know, you're man snowing, you're like this cool right. thing, you're like, how could you feel that way? Um, and right. it's doesn't mean that I mean just because things are going well doesn't mean that you don't you feel different inside and outside are different things this is how I realized I actually needed some help was I realized I was depressed I didn't want to be depressed but that didn't keep me from falling on the ground and being in a fetal position crying for half of a day yeah like knowing better like we know we're not supposed to walk in the middle of the road right and no matter how weird things get we're probably not going to just wander out in the middle of the road but there were times in my day where I found myself like so out of myself that I was wandering out of my body. Like we have a hiking trail that I love to run. I love to hike. But there was a day I just took a hike and I was literally just weeping on this hike. And I remember like if I would have walked into another person, they probably would have had me committed because I yeah. was just outside of myself. Yeah. And, and why, something... why do you think you got to that place? Um, i not exactly sure. I guess if I could explain it. Um, I just too much pressure. Too much I was pressure. trying to be too much. Yeah. Um, so I what brought it. me to the spot of feeling depressed, um, was trying to be this celebrity, yeah. trying to make my numbers grow fast, trying to yeah. make sure everybody loved every project. So let's just stop there. That's just the so too I, much, right? Yeah. Yeah. Now my goal is to make sure that I create one project that each one of my fans will like once. Meaning that if I have 150,000 subscribers on YouTube, that means I need to create 150,000 projects so that there's one for each person. Does that make sense? Yeah, that does. It's... And, and so I, I let go some of the pressure go. And that actually, there was the easiest way to wrap it up is Sean White, our wonderful Olympian professional snowboarder. Okay. He told the story at the beginning of this year's Winter Olympics because four years ago he went as a two-time gold medal champion who, just to shorten the story, basically got to the top of the half pipe in the final on his very first run and did such an amazing job that nobody could compete. Interesting. So so this was his first year at the Olympics and his second year. And so the third time coming back, so this is 12 years in the running, the man is like the world champion. And those of us who follow board sports, like, you know, they see Sean White and everybody right. just knows Sean White. Right. Well, well, I guess I think it was Seoul, Korea, please don't quote me. But four years ago, he got there and he was going to do two different sports, 
snowboarding related and the, the conditions were terrible. So he pulls out a one to just focus on the half pipe, his best event. And I don't remember it, but I don't think he even made it to the qualifying final. I think he did so poorly. He didn't even make it to the final round, let alone he didn't get a medal. Yeah. So here's this guy who we expect so much of so much, that so didn't much. get a medal. Yeah. And after he didn't win, he went home and started a clothing line. He started a rock band. He started to train differently. And when he came back four years later, yeah. he said, what I learned is snowboarding was fun. And the, once I got into the competitive level of snowboarding, and once I became a two-time gold medalist, it no longer was it wasn't fun. fun. I yeah. was going to be the three time in a row gold. Like saying, Marshall, right. all, you know, all these guys that have, and ladies, excuse me, yeah. all of these people that have these incredible statuses they've built, yeah. you know, they feel like they've got to keep producing, right. you know, they've got to, you know, it was That's the right. end of the Eagles for a long time. You know, if you watch a wonderful documentary on the Eagles band, yeah. them trying to write great music over and over yeah. again. The pressure. Part of the, yeah. The pressure. Yeah. The pressure. So she, so Sean White says the best thing that ever happened to him was losing Interesting. because he found himself and he found his friends and he yeah. started snowboarding to snowboard and not to win. Yeah. You know? And so I, I yeah. looked at I my, like that. my lifestyle at man sewing. And so what I was starting to say is I felt like I was truly battling some mental illness mm-hmm. or overwhelming stress because right. I was at a point where I saw it and I couldn't run away from it. Yeah. So therefore I had to battle what my fear was. I had to face it. And, and your fear was, I, I don't want to be too failing. personal. Your fear yeah, was failing. Yeah, no, my fear was failing. And yeah. so you have to describe what is failing. So yeah, totally. Me, failing, this is ridiculous, yeah. right? Yeah. The right. kind of, and the, and I think the kind, so we're an experiment. We're not, so I'm a law professor. I don't even know if okay. you know that. So I'm a yeah, law professor I and I teach, um, I teach intellectual property. And, and what IP professors do now is we try to understand sort of the world within, the world of law and creativity by actually doing it like, one studies craft beer. Everybody thinks that they, they're they very clever, that they're studying craft beer. Like, that's what they, they go and drink beer a lot at different places. Um, right. But sort of this immersive thing. And so it's, so this is not my job. Quilting is not my job. Right? It is my job in the right. sense I'm researching it. But I can sort of sense that. Like, And I'm not a celebrity. I'm just a law right. professor. But I felt that pressure. Like, being immersed in it. It is constant. There are uh, there is an expectation of like your numbers and how many how 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 you're performing and how you're connecting to people and what events are you doing and what are you doing this and this and this and this and this and it's a very full space professionally a very full space that you're in that is um, it's really a lot um, and I I I. I, in a teeny tiny way, felt like when I came back from market and festival, now I'm somebody who works a lot. I'm like a total like never take a day off kind of person. And I was used up. Like I wasn't, I didn't oh, yeah. feel like myself after being there for 12 days um, with all of that, all that was coming in and, and the obligations and all the things that have to happen. I mean, it's not just like being there, right? It's the relationships and the things and the obligations and people you need to hear and this good, blah, blah, blah. And for you, I mean, it must be just like 5,000 times more. And I can't imagine that's your life every day. I would imagine, um, and if if you don't, you if you're not careful, you know. Are you frozen? Oh, there you are. Okay, you back? Oh, good. Oh, yeah. Yes, I am. Okay, cool. I turned off my video, and I'm turning off the surf report too to get my best internet. Cool. Awesome. So yeah, let me see if, okay, let me see if this works. Let me do that. Okay. So, so yeah, so, so you, I mean, I suspect now for those that don't know your story, let's do just a quick recap of sort of how you got to. We're still in the introduction. (laughs) We're still in the introduction is too, but uh, we're kind of that way. Like we're not really about, you know, I don't know that it's a little bit, uh, we're kind of cool with what, this is kind of what the show is about. It's just kind of really who you are. Um, So I think what's interesting about you is you can like people know you. You're like when people when I told you're very famous. You're very so famous, um, and part of that is your relationship with Missouri Stars. Would you say that that's really sort of what catapulted you, or were you that were you something before Missouri Star? Um, okay, so there's a lot of ways to answer that question. Yeah, but ab- absolutely, Missouri Star has been an amazing launch for my career. Um, but I was making quilts because of being part of my mom's quilt shop 
Right. Um, I started making stuff back in 2001. I put out my first quilt pattern in 2001. And um, being a male, a young guy at that point. Yeah, you're like a late, thing, right? I was, right, and I had a, I had a big curly hair. Uh, half you're like a thing. They, everybody. Giant ponytail. Yeah, people yeah, loved you. Yeah, the surfing quilter guy, the yeah. whole thing going for me that way. Yeah. And so when we come back to the conversation about fears and depression and that kind of stuff, um, one of the things that I don't have this, the same fear as a lot of the other female artists that are in my world because it is so heavily dominated by females. Yeah. There's a lot more com competition. So for me to be one, not 75. Yeah. Two, to be a male. Right. Um, it was, and, and more from a surfing standpoint than a, you know, and a, a nature, like I'm more of a naturalist than I am a designer. Does yeah. Does that make any sense? Yeah, it so, does. And so, so come, your brand is, you have a very strong band, brand right out, out of the gate. Like you're, you, you're, you're a thing from the beginning because like you're super identifiable. Like right. people know you immediately. Right. And a lot of that is the good work of Missouri Star as well because of man sewing and the, the way yeah. we've done it. Uh, but there's also a lot of uh, actually internal uh, confusion and frustration within the brand too because I am not just doing projects for men. No. And um, so we want to make sure everybody knows it's more – if we if we really would have termed it a man sewing, a man sewing, right? Because <laughs> like, I'm just I'm just another person making checks. Just check style a products. person. I'm yeah, not great. And it does yes. it doesn't have anything to do with my plumbing. I don't use that tool in my yeah. sewing room. It's you know? funny, it's isn't just, it? Yes, it's weird that we it, identify. My kid is non-binary, so so it's really we had all these conversations, and it's funny when people identify you by sort of your body parts or who you are when it really right? has nothing to do with that. Um, right. It's very right. interesting. Especially in my, my career or my artwork. But yeah. at the same point, it's also been so freeing because being, a, you know, a person that started making landscape quilts, yeah. with fusible web, and then machine quilting them together back in the early 90s, that was pretty much considered uh, inappropriate. That was taboo. So interesting, and, isn't it? Oh, yeah. And there was a whole faction of folks that really considered that what they called it art quilting, but it had two T's. So it became a four letter word. That's just, so interesting, isn't it? But but for me, it didn't matter because he's just that guy that works at his mom's quilt shop. It's no big deal. But for any other female that would have tried yeah. it, they would have been completely ridiculed and would have never been able to launch their career. That yeah, way. it's interesting, and, isn't it? And when would yeah, you it, you would. So tell me again the day. I'm always curious about dates. When do yeah. you feel that you became like, like this was like, so you, you would say, was it 2001 that you said that you start, you made your first pattern? I put up my first pattern in 2001. Yes. And I was working as a sewing machine technician because my mom's quilt shop had brought in a sewing machine dealership starting in 1997. So I had worked around the sewing machines for about three or four years before I made my first quilt because I wanted to free motion. Yeah. I was very interested in the free motion machine quilting as an art form. Yeah. Interesting. But um, I also was making quilts and making surfboard bags and making Hawaiian shirts. Very I needed cool. to learn yeah. what, what different fabrics and different kinds of needles and threads and approaches to machines would do for my customers as a service tech. Yeah. Because I, I love to make it and it is meant as a joke, but it's I think it's one hundred percent true. But of all sewing machine mechanics, I'm the best quilter. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> yeah. I like that a lot. Um, yeah. uh, do you know um, Andy uh, Barney? She's a Red Hand Stitch Shop in Marietta, Georgia. She's got this whole thing. She um, she's doing um, helping people learn how to uh, care for their machines and also teaching people that have been in prison because she was in prison herself um, right. as a uh, profession. She's like this. Got this is whole it, thing. It's the sewing doctor. Is it called I think. the sewing machine. Oh, okay. I think. Uh, I, I was also talking to some folks kind of near where your booth was at, where the philanthropy booths were, that is the sewing machine project. Yes, that's a different thing. No, she's, you, I okay. should connect you to her. She's really cool Definitely. and really interesting um, and yeah. really, um, that's like a thing. And she's like, a, she's awesome. I think she's going to be like, she's so cool. Anyway. Um, uh, I would, yeah, I would love to do more maintenance videos on man sewing. It's just a little bit oh, you should, hard. Yeah, you should chat with her too because she's like a, she's cool. She, you'd like her. She's, she's, you know. She's like a thing too. She's very, um, you know, she's cool. So rad, young, cool, 
you know, never know what color hair she's going to have kind of tattooed hipster person who has this cool shop in Marietta, Georgia. So, How cool. Yeah, she's great. Anyway, okay. So how did the relationship with Missouri Star begin? Oh, yeah. So uh, that quilt shop that I got my start in after several years, my mom decided to retire. And I, because I'm in a small little community, I thought there's no way I want to give up this quilt shop even though my mom was encouraging me to go out and teach and travel and be an independent designer. Um, And so I tried to run the shop for about a year and a half and did a terrible job. And so my mom came back and helped me sell the shop. Uh, So the shop's still around, even though um, I no longer work there. And then I was traveling and basically going to quilt guilds. What? What is it about quilting that that creates that? Because it is this whole, like, it's like, it's a... It's almost like a religion, right? It's not just like, oh, I, whatever, I crossed it to whatever. Something about quilting, people get like totally immersed in it, it in this it incredible way. It becomes their identifying marker. Like yeah. when you meet a person, like they're like, no, I'm a quilter. I'm like, oh, that's fantastic. What did What do you do for a living? Oh, well, uh, I'm a heart surgeon and right. I save uh, premature babies. Right. It's you know, so insane, right? might be a little bit more important than quilting. I'm sorry. But I, I know. That's, you know, and they're like, no, I make patchwork quilts at night. Right, I'm, exactly. You know, like, what? Are you not? It is you such know? a unifying thing. It's so amazing. And you can know somebody for a long time and you have no idea that like, oh, they are, right? They are a heart surgeon or some like crazy thing. Um, right. Because there's a, a bond. The quilting creates this really interesting bond. I don't understand it. It's remarkable. And the level of kindness in this community is just amazing. People choose to be here and they choose to be kind for the most part. Yes. It's yes, remarkable. Absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. So, so, yeah, it was because of, of that and because of the idea of getting as many people involved in quilting as possible. Because we do believe, and I think it may be starting to get scientifically proven, that there is healing that happens when you work with your hand that's Um, interesting whether whether it's physical definitely emotional healing um that comes from it a lot of people come to quilting out of a need whether they you know anyways i don't want to i don't want to take that that, but but so that's no 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 but we hear this over and over again the sort of the healing power and i certainly so i quilt at the end of my day um that's just what i do and it is you know, I always have this choice of like, well, should I go to bed or should I quilt for a little while? And I know I'm going to feel better if I quilt for a little while. Like, there's something very therapeutic about it. That, it, And it could be, I mean, it's everything. The hum of the machine, the feel of the fabric, sort of what your brain does when you start to quilt. It's, yeah. there's something more going on there. Well, and I'm going to just take it a step further because I'm pretty sure I figured it out. Of course, I'm you pretty did? sure half of the people are going to argue with what I'm about to say, but I'm yeah. going to say it anyways. And so it's not just quilting. I think it's all tactile art related stuff, whether it's painting, whether it's drawing, knitting, crochet, hand sewing, quilting, maybe cooking, maybe gardening, whatever it is. But I'm a believer and I believe God has created us in his likeness. And that means that we are also creative people. And so I just believe that I do best when I am creating something. Yeah. And so learning to fail is important because you can't always create everything perfectly. You've got to be willing to get it wrong mm-hmm. and keep moving on. That's what they teach at our wonderful middle school here. It's a place that they, they teach kids you don't get a failing grade unless you stop. You can just keep trying and trying and trying until That's great. you get further. I like that. You know? Yeah. doesn't mean you get an A, but you get further. You know, yeah. no one's left behind. You get further. Way. Yeah, no one's left and, behind. And, That's great. And so I love technology, and I love the fact that we're sitting here talking to each other over computers and looking at each other and all of that kind of stuff. But, man, I tell you, at the end of the day, I don't slow down until I unplug. And I either pull out a guitar or I, I have a little knitting project I like to work on or I do a little bit of drawing. Sometimes I just rewrite my sewing notes for the day, but I have a pencil that I've made for myself on the lathe. And I just, I personally know that at the speed I travel, that's my quickest dose of mellow is yeah. just to get involved in an it's art really project. It's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And for me, it's just where I think I just finally stop. I start to breathe deeper, and I'm I'm not looking at uh, things that have uh, vibration, you know, like a, a screen. I'm, you know, I love music, and I listen to music, so I know there's wavelength involved there, you know, so if you want to get into a scientific conversation about it. But, um, yeah. I just, for me, I just, I really think that it, it, is, it is provable 
uh, whether you want to believe it's because we're we're descendants of God or not, you yeah. know, that, that's that's the debatable fact. I get right, that. But, but there's something in but, our innate makeup that we are creative beings from the start. Yeah. Yes, and even that's why I think reading is so great before bed because even if you're reading a book, you know, you, you put it down and if it, your brain keeps telling the story, you know, yeah. until your eyelids get heavy. And then, then it, yeah. so anyways, I really believe it's important that we do things tactily. And I also, that, so that brings us back to the question about Missouri Star. So Missouri Star said, we have to do more channels for more kinds of people because we've hit this wonderful thing where we are teaching people to give quilt and 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 take care of themselves and take care of others in their community by quilt making and and jenny's doing a fantastic job but there are people that are coming to jenny that are saying this is great but i'm a young guy interested i'm a young gal interested i'm a you know i'm i'm just i'm different than your traditional quilter and that's kind of the the genre that jenny fills well and it's um and it's so interesting because um, diversifying the brand is such a strong, a good thing to do. That, And I keep saying this, like, brands thrive when it's more than just, like, one person at the head of the brand. And so that was so clever of them to be expanding the brand to more than just Jenny, you know? Oh, well, yeah. I mean, for on my side of the coin, it's just been the, giant, the biggest hand up I've yeah. ever had in my life. You yeah. know, like, this was something that I was – really trying to do. I, I had worked with Alex Anderson and Ricky Timms on the quilt show, doing yeah. little, you know, home yeah. videos. I'd been on their show. They're dear, dear friends of mine. I had begged them to put me in front of the camera because I really felt that if I could get to a bigger audience and teach more, I could figure out a way to really survive and feed my family. Yeah. Uh, my wife's a school teacher here in California, oh, which is a, nice. it's a great job, but it's not the most high paying job. Yeah. So she's not that heart surgeon I was talking about. Yeah, <laughs> so, right. so I I feel fairly responsible to try to make it a good income. And yeah. It's hard to do in quilting. It is hard. Yeah. Now let's yeah. talk a little bit about that side of it. So I would think that that is the now you don't have to you don't have to answer my question. You actually don't ever have to answer my questions, but I imagine that a percentage well, of your you um your income comes from public appearances, right? That that going to quilt shops and I mean and uh, guilds and all of that is a, a percentage of it and then whatever kind of contract or relationship you have with Missouri Star is also a, a good chunk of sort of how you make your money your living is that am I right absolutely um now if you're asking me specifically as Rob Appel actually uh, in the last couple of years uh, a majority of my income has come from Missouri Star uh, because they basically decided, let's not worry about the fine print and let's put Rob on a creative salary. That's great. And um, so he can be creative and we can um, grow the brand and not worry so much. Uh, so I get paid to create the videos, but I also get paid to create products on a royalties basis. That's great. That's great. Uh, and you've got the, is it, it the shark? Is that like, are you creating yes. those tools and those are Missouri Star brand? That's like their, you're yeah, able to well, create sh- things? Yeah, the shark is its own beast, it is. Uh, pun intended. Yeah. And that, that was one of the things that I actually had designed, developed, and had a prototype in my hand when I went into negotiations with Missouri Star. Interesting. And I, I really wanted to keep it as close to my heart as possible to control the way that it was sold and the way that the pricing went. Yeah. And really just to make sure that I stayed in the driver's seat of yeah. financially. I'm, I've always looked at the shark as my kid's college fund. Yeah, um, I get that. Yeah, and so um, Missouri Star actually funded the project, and they paid for all the molding and the trademarking and patenting and all that kind of stuff. And then now we're we're basically just fifty fifty partners on it. So we, you good. you can buy them from Missouri Star if you want to purchase them retail, but you, if you wanted to carry them in your quilt shop, you can also buy them from Missouri Star wholesale. That's great. Um, yeah, and I go out on, whenever I'm traveling in my suitcase. They're in my suitcase. So yes, I go to. I go to quilt guilds. Yeah. I've always enjoyed the guilds because I used to own my own quilt shop. And so going to other quilt shops is tough because a lot of the income comes from your sales, actually. So you get a nice fee for giving your class. Yeah. And you get a nice fee for giving your trunk show. Um, and other artists that are out there, they make a lot of money on either designing fabric or designing, you know, writing books. Writing books, right. You know, um, I, I, if you look at a lot, all of us really have our hands in about everything possible out yeah. there, whether it, it's tool and product endorsement or development, whether yeah. it's 
um, you know, now, and with the use of YouTube and videos and things like Craftsy and, yeah. and all of us being able to make our own, um, you know, go at, at things, like I said, with YouTube is, is pretty impressive. So at the moment right now, my a majority of my income comes from uh, man sewing through Missouri Star. Yeah. And yeah. then the other side of that is, is that the busier I get, I'm actually finally hit a place where I can start to say no to some of my travel. That was a, another thing of my fear. I was afraid I was gone from home too much. Yeah. And I, but when I, you know, I live in California, I live on the beach, I have a pretty expensive lifestyle and I have been running my tail off for the last 20 years to try to afford it. And I had to say yes to every single job that came my way. And just in the last two years, I've been able to start to pick and choose a little bit which has freed up my calendar to make better choices and spend more time. The other fear I was having was not being able to do good project development. I felt like I wasn't putting the... Yeah, because you're spread too thin. Um, okay, so one thing, let's let's chat a little bit more about the guild experience because you're doing that yeah. so much right now. So yeah. you get, a, as you said, you get a speaking fee for the guild and the trunk show and the yes. pay your, your pay your expenses to get there, I imagine. Yes. And then yes. the merchandising part of like things that you bring with you is also part of that bump in, that makes it worthwhile. Is that what you're saying? That's that that's part of it as well, that it's expected as part of the guild experience that you've got the shark thing or kits or whatever it is that you're bringing for that particular experience. Oh, you should see me weighing my suitcase. You know, I have two suitcases. Each one can weigh exactly 50 pounds <laughs> and because it, it's a nightmare to try to ship stuff in advance. Everybody right. tells you, just ship your stuff forward, oh, no, you know, no, but no. it costs money and all of that's these right. things. And so my trunk show weighs um, about 58 pounds. The teaching samples usually bring in another eight to 10 pounds. Uh-huh. And I'm down at the end where I've got those fishing scales and I'm adding like here, one more shark, That's two so more funny. sets of blades. Oh yeah, it, it's awesome. It's and then I get to the airport and I forget that I've been upgraded to first class because I have a silver status and it doesn't matter how much is in Doesn't there. matter. But, That's so yeah. funny. Now, how do you, when you're at the guild shows and you're like, do you have someone at the guild? Like, how do you do the like buying part of it? Like, are you oh, doing square. it? Square. You just do square and you're just doing that part too? Yep. What I've learned is everything has an even number price. All the taxes included. I deal with that when I get home. Yeah. It makes life easier for everybody. Uh, I usually have a guild volunteer that then helps. Um, I run my, I have a big 12 inch iPad. It's what you and I are getting on right right now. Yeah. I use that for square. Uh, My products are all built into it with just a name. So all the the easy for them. They can just push it. Yep. Yep. That's great. Because what I like to do at the end of the experience is I like to be there to take the picture or give a hug. Yeah, exactly. And that was my thing. I, how did you, like, that seems to be, like, really stressful to be, like, selling stuff and everybody wants to spend time with you. So you get a volunteer there to do the selling part for you. I think I want to ask you one more thing. So um, do you know Pam Week? She's a curator at New England Quilt Museum. She says that she's bipolar, meaning she loves to do indoor and outdoor activities. So when oh, we yeah. were... Right. So, um, and that she needs both in her life. So I'm wondering, we talked about the creative side, but you're also do a lot of like running, surfing, all of that. Like, how does that, how does that part of it play into, and my husband, like I quilt, I'm not a, I'm not an outdoorsy person, but he loves bike riding. Like he'll go on like a 50 mile bike ride or whatever all the time, like every day if he could. So I'm curious, like how that side of it plays for you. Like how important is the outdoor side, the physical side for you? Uh, incredibly important. Um, I, I have to be in a place where I feel comfortable creating. My, my creative calendar doesn't stop, unfortunately. It, it, because I put out a video every Monday, yeah. I, don't, I don't get the option to not feel motivated to be creative. Yeah. So my, my, my counteraction to that doldrums or the lack of motivation is just to be physically fit and kind of an adrenaline junkie. And when you're doing that, do you feel like you are create, are you create, are you, what are you doing when you like, are you thinking about creative things? Is it just going away? So what are your thoughts when you're in that physical space? Yeah, I've just been figuring it out this year because I've been working so hard to become mentally fit Yeah, um, because it's been my biggest struggle. Yeah. So for me, uh, one, it's an endorsement, endorphin relief. 
So I do things like surfing, but where I live, the surf can sometimes be a little bit difficult, you know, so, or it's cold. It just, it puts you in an environment where you're, where you're on edge a little bit. Um, I I don't run around a track. I run on a trail up and down a mountain. And so it's at any moment I can fall or wipe out. Um, So there's, I guess it's part of that, like just living in the moment, being present. And so I'm also learning, it doesn't have to be outside. so I, I've started doing yoga. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've started doing some deep breathing, you know, through yoga uh, right. as well. And I'm finding that just being able to be calm and released and not have everything in my head at once creates the space that lowers my heart rate, lowers my breathing rate, and makes me feel that calm, zeny like, you know, Interesting. behavior. I, I believe that I'm ADHD. I make yeah. the joke that I've never sat long enough to take the test. Yeah, but I find that there are moments. Well, a lot of times my brain is really, really busy. Interesting. And then the other times, like I was talking about, one before I go to bed or whatnot, that calming zone. Whenever I can get into that super hyper focus where you couldn't peel me away if the house was on fire. Yeah. That's when I'm my happier. Interesting. And 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 so whether if I'm on a run, I it's a, I know it takes me 20 minutes to do my run. So I know that I'm going to dedicate 20 minutes plus a little cleanup time. And so no matter what happens for the next 30 minutes, my cell phone is not going to get answered. I'm yeah. just going to go out and just have some, some exercise. What yeah. I'm also starting to learn is that one of my emotional struggles is, will I get my job done? The fear of, will I get the project done on time? Interesting. And I work late at night and I, and I have my, my kids, you know, I work out of my home. So when I'm home, I'm also the taxi. I used yeah. to be in the restaurant business. I used to be an assistant chef at a fantastic restaurant. Man, I can cook to be bragging a bunch yeah. today. Uh-huh. You know? no, and good. so I, I, my wife is incredibly busy. So if I can provide as many meals at our home as possible, great. But that also means I do the grocery shopping. Yeah. And I can't walk by the laundry and like let it build up. You know, I right. just, so it's really hard for me to get my focus time. So I used to freak out that it would be two o'clock. And I'd be like, I haven't started working right now. Like, <laughs> totally. I mean, you, you can see. I totally feel that video. way, right? Check it like, out. my so day has night. not started yet, right? <laughs> right, right. So. Yeah, I get I it. Hope I know. So last night at midnight, I got the safety pins in that quilt back there. Basically. That's great. Right. You know, and so it's ready to be quilted. But I also know that I won't, I don't have to start till two o'clock or three o'clock on that today. Yeah. Even though I, everyone else's workday might start at eight or nine a.m. Yeah. And I was trying to start my work day by not, by 10 a.m. every day. And it, was it doesn't driving work. me insane. Yeah. And I'm and back to the fact that we do some of these things because we love them. And some of the things that I love the most about being able to do what I do is, you know, if my neighbor calls and they need their help with their hot water heater, I, I don't have to quilt the quilt at this minute. I can quilt yeah. it later and go help with the hot water heater or whatever. Yeah, I, I get it. You know? That's that's why I actually I became a law professor because our, our schedule is so flexible that I had a small kid and – that's I wanted to spend time with my kid like I you know yeah. I make a good I mean being a law professor is a good job but I yeah. um it was a choice because again I wanted you know and now that she's 15 I'm like she's like hey will you take my friends places or will you take me here I'm like yes like I only yeah. get th- I only get like two and a half more years of like her needing me in that way and so I'll yeah. drop anything in any way to sort of be spend that time with her um because I think that's so important so I think that's very cool. It means that your days do sometimes start at ten o'clock at night, but I'm okay with that. You know that happens. You know that just yeah. that's the that's the price of choosing to have to be part of people's lives. I guess you know. Another trick I've learned, in case people are listening that are similar to you and I, yeah, um, is that I am pretty good at multitasking, but I've had to separate what things can be multitask. Interesting. Yes, tell me that. So. Because I'm an anxiety junkie, mm-hmm. um, and I used to be in the restaurant business, as I mentioned, but part of my job was running the line. Like I was the guy that called out the tickets. I was the guy that told everybody what to do. So when I walk into my kitchen, I'm in high pace mode. I'm going, going, going. When I'm in my studio, I want to be going slow. So I can fold laundry and cook at the same time. But I can't go back and forth from my studio and sew binding on. I can't sew a 45-inch seam go back and stir the pasta and come back and do it. That's really activity. interesting. So you know which activities can be multitasked yes. and which can't. I've never thought about it yes. that way. I think I'm going to think about that. I think I'm going to do an inventory of what needs to be solitary. I feel like, guess that about writing? Yeah. Writing for yeah. me is that way. Yeah, I want, I don't yeah. want, I mean, I can be interrupted, but 
you know, there's got to be kind of a, a space. Yeah. Yeah. I and mean, it's easy. It's an easy experiment. Start with the thing you love the most. Yeah. And isolate that. Interesting. Whatever that is, you isolate that and stop trying to interrupt the thing you love the most yes. with other stuff. Now, and then you can cope. Now, what do you not like to do? What part do you just think like, I am not doing this part? Like in your, your day or what's the part that's the yucky part of your day? I really struggle with this feeling of being interrupted. I feel like every moment should be dedicated to my art. And, yeah. and when I want to work, I want to be able to work. So sometimes this is what, I, what I'm trying to say is coming to terms with the fact that the kids get picked up at the middle school at 245. Yeah. Whether I started my day at two o'clock or not. <laughs> right. I used to try Indeed. to start at 10 so I could be ready at 245 for the pickup. <laughs> right. But now if I start at two and I have to stop at 245, it's my own fault. That's right. Or it's my own blessing. So sometimes I'll go, okay, I have a 45 minute project. I can fit this into this window. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So that's been part of that strategy. That's interesting. And that you look at the, I imagine you look at the clock differently. You think like, okay, nine minutes. I could do, what can I do? I could do oh stuffing in nine minutes, you know? <laughs> like, I've got, I think I've got carpal tunnel in my shoulder and my elbow from looking at my wrist so much. Like I wear MC Hammer's necklace as my watch. I that's just, so funny. I'm I love addicted it. to time. Well, so, so that's where yeah. we haven't talked about so many things and we're almost at an hour. I love your endangered species quilts and your sea, seascape. Can we talk a little bit about those before we end? Sure. Okay, cool. Sure. Um, I mean, so, I'll give you five hours if you want. I love, I love doing this. I, the audience won't be listening anymore, no. but I'll talk with you all day long. We had our longest one was um, Mary Fonz and Tula Pink came to the house because they were in town. Two and oh, a half right. hours. Like they just, I'm oh, like, I, I kept saying like, are you sure? They're like, yeah. Oh, so it was. I can beat that. Uh-huh. You can beat that. Let me, te- let me text Tula right now and tell her I got that one whooped. Totally. Too. It's now just going to be yeah. a contest of who can yeah, like, right. um, but no, I mean, it's funny because these are just convert. I mean, this is kind of what the project's about is really trying to understand you and what you do. And then I'm going to ask you one question about intellectual property after we talk about your yeah. quilts. But yeah. I think it's What can I tell you about endangered species? Tell yeah. me about yeah. tell me about the project. Tell me about what you love about it. Tell me about why you do that project. Tell me just about the project. Um, well it started back in I think two thousand and nine. Mm-hmm. And actually it was I was working with Michael Miller Fabrics pretty exclusively at that point, just using a lot of their cloth to make quilts and mm-hmm. make, you know, show quilts for their booth. Yeah. Um, and we were talking, I was on a surf trip in Costa Rica and I, I love applique and it all just kind of came together that I started creating these kind of larger than life, basically focused on the eyes of the animals. And I did 12 different animals, try to hit a bunch of different genres. You know, we have a polar bear and a Bengal tiger and an iguana right. and a penguin and a clownfish and, you know, just a bunch of different stuff. I also in the process found, um, the kids were really interested in it. So that was a lot of the driving fa- factor behind it is now because these were smaller projects, kids were seeing animals that they recognized. I selfishly, you know, used animals that they would really, that know, they like, yeah, of, like a clownfish, you know, Nemo did a lot for us. With, right. Uh, right. That, that's a great Nemo. quilt. Yes. yes. It's yeah. totally Nemo. It's totally yeah, like, yeah. You. Yeah, well, no, it technically is a percula clownfish. And what's kind of fun is when I talk to kids about it, I can teach them that the percula clownfish is actually the easiest clownfish to raise in aquariums. So even though the reef's endangered, we can save the reef by doing what's called aquaculture. So we can start saltwater farms indoors. That's so you know? cool. So, That's yeah, great. So there's a lot of education out there. And I do a lot with that, actually. Um, or I did. I should. I don't do as much anymore because the endangered species project has kind of come and gone yeah um but it was a philanthropy project we raised a bunch of money for different charities which was super cool so um so what so you've moved away from that but that was sort of an important component of your career would you say it was huge yeah because it's it's when i first started learning about philanthropy and giving as a quilt maker also yeah because before that it was all about creating stuff that was really financially driven. It was yeah. patterns. It was kids. It was stuff that would sell. It was stuff that was available in the marketplace. I wasn't trying to create something that I would go out and continually source materials for and, yeah. and things like that. And then my bigger project that I'm incredibly proud of um, was when I got involved with Island Batik and did the quilted in honor. Um, I did a big American flag with the Iwo Jima Memorial an applique on top of that. I don't know if you've ever seen that. No, I haven't seen that one. Let me take a look. Oh my God. If you go on my robapel.com website, uh, there's a a picture of it. It's a five foot tall, eight foot long quilt 
but we basically now here's I give myself credit for fifty thousand dollars raised for our wow. marketing of this quilt. Wow! How how is how do you do that? That's remarkable. Well, you make a quilt and you give it away for oh, an here it auction. Is. I love it. Here it is. Yeah. Thank you. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And the auction um, the auction didn't happen, and I don't know why. Um, but a, a, a bigger part of my story too is I'm also a recovering alcoholic, and this was the first quilt I really made in my recovery process. So this was six years ago now; it's almost seven. Amazing. Um, and so, in doing it, when I finished the quilt, I gave. I just I can't do anything else with it. I the, I don't want to make a pattern here. Just take the quilt, raise the money. Yeah. And and, but then a couple years later, we realized it wasn't going to auction. Uh, I was back with the quilt in Sisters, Oregon, to shorten the story up. Uh huh. Um, and I was kind of challenged to continue the mission. I'd never raised any money with it. So uh -huh. I called Operation Homefront, the people I donated the quilt to, and said, uh -huh. listen, I want to raise the money with the quilt. I guess I'll buy the quilt back. And they said, but Rob, you put a $25,000 minimum bid on this quilt. <laughs> and, and I said, okay, well, I'm good for it, but not. I, I don't have 25 grand today. I've got the quilt with me. I'm going to travel around and tell my story, and I'll get you 25 grand. Can I have about a year? And they said, we'll give you at least a year, you know, do what you can. And so you raised so, money with the quilt you made by going around and telling the story about the quilt for Operation yep. Homefront. Absolutely. Yep. And I raised, I had about five large donors. Uh -huh. And then every, and so let's see, about, 50, I'm going to say about $15,000 came in between 20s and, and singles. Amazing. And, and you used GoFundMe and, as part of that? And then I in did. person? I'm seeing yeah, your GoFundMe yeah. thing. That's yeah. really amazing. So, uh, yeah, basically raised the, the $25,000 from quilt guilds and uh, talking up the quilt as I traveled. And then as I donated the money into Operation Homefront, I did it in two different phases based on what Operation Homefront was doing. Procter & Gamble was doing one of these things where up to $25,000, <laughs> they would do a match. Donation. That's so clever. You're so and clever. So the, first, the first time <laughs> it happened was like, I'm going to say like September-ish. And I, I had a little over $14,000 in the account I had started. So I gave them an even 14000 then. And then I raised the other $11,000. And it was the end of the year last year and turned it in then. And it happened to be Procter & Gamble a second time. So wow. that's why I say give myself credit for right. 50000 For raised. doubling it. That's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. And tells yeah. you that like you can be all kinds of things. You can be entrepreneurial. You can be selling stuff. You can be all of that. But you also have space for giving and for something outside of yourself, which is super important too. Yeah. Oh, that's what I was starting to spell out when I think the audio cut out yeah. was that um, once it was cool the way it happened though because I got a salary from Missouri Star. So now all of a sudden it didn't matter if I was selling as much at every quilt guild. Yeah. Right. Because people only have so much money in their wallet. So right. I stopped bringing merchandise and just put out my donation jar. Mm, nice. And so that 25 grand, you know, it, it was really neat. And what it taught me, because this was at a point where I didn't quite have enough income for myself. Mm -hmm. And I even met a young lady who was, she introduced herself that was a, a, a child victim of a, adult al or fetal alcohol syndrome. Mm-hmm. And she came to a, a presentation and she literally gave me 16 cents. And it was yeah, really cool. Yeah. Like right. Really, really a When people donation. give, yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't, that's, yeah. That's it, it matters. Yeah. Right. Changed a lot. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's back to your whole, like, who we are, like, who we are as people and sort of what our role is on this planet and right. that giving space. I mean, quilting, like... The level of charity quilting and giving and kindness is remarkable. You know, like it really oh, yeah. is incredibly moving. Um, oh, and, yeah. So many you know, people start their first quilt to make it a baby present or a wedding gift. It's insane, everybody gives right? stuff away, right? Yeah. Most of us yeah. are giving it away to strangers too, right? right? Strangers. We don't even know who gets our quilts. We make them and we just give them away. A lot of times that's yeah. how it happens. Yeah, yeah, we received that. Missouri Star received nine thousand quilts sent in for Hurricane Harvey last. Week. It was crazy, and they just got a ton more that they just sent to California for the fire victims. It's amazing, right? Yeah, it's just incredible. And what I think, and, and this is my, and we we can stop as soon. But I think what I think when, when I'm doing when I'm looking at this project, it's not just about the quilting. It's not just about community, but there's something about like you're saying the whole tactile. 
Like, like I feel like when people are quilting, they're also quilting in love. They're quilting in something of themselves. There's, yeah. it's more than just the, it's, not, you know, it's different. There's something, uh, there's something more going on. I think, and, and when you pick up an old quilt that you don't, you, you still feel. I mean, maybe it's just like our, you know, uh, personification, putting, a, putting something on that, that's not there. But you do feel that love that that someone took all that time to make that thing. Um, Absolutely. You know, and it means I don't know. That's awesome. And that's part of the quilt that you made. You made that, right? You made that. You thought about that. You made it. It must be incredible in person. It's pretty online. Um, and that it's more than just, it's something more, right? It's something, a bit of you is in that quilt in a way that is really profound. Oh, yeah. It's, yeah. it's unreal. Yeah. yeah. It definitely will uh, initiate emotional responses. I see yeah. it all the time. Yeah. So cool. You are... Amazing. Okay, so last question. Uh, intellectual property, what role does it play? What are your worries? Obviously, they trademarked your name and, I mean, man, uh, man sewing has been trademarked and they're, you're protecting right. your stuff with patents. But sort of what role do you think about intellectual property when you're creating or you don't worry about it? or All the time. Oh, no, I worry a ton about it. You do. But, but not mine. Others. Others, others. intellectual property. Yeah. Um, it's really difficult to create something once a week and try to make it completely your own. Yeah. Try to be a good educator, but in the world of quilting, there are so many things that, you know, somebody might think they created. Yeah. There are there are times when literally a ma- two magazines will come out on the same day right. and they'll both have the features right. and they're different quilters from different sides of the world that have come up with the exact same design and the right. exact same color, you know. Things yeah. like this happen. Yeah. Um for me, it's a bigger picture now, though, because I am so well blessed and I am so well provided for. I don't want to ever take and put something on my channel as a free tutorial that's going to take from somebody else's yeah. opportunity to make an income. That makes sense. So I try to be really careful. I try to use very, very, very basic patchwork when I make, you know, it's half square triangles, literally, right. that, or and squares and rectangles. Yeah. And I, and, I, and I try not to ever create, you know, a pattern or a, a, a somebody's, you know, real bread and butter that yeah, I go and, I get that. And, and make it. Although what I have also found is with videos, you know, the more videos I put out, the more my patterns sell for the same video. The yeah. more, you know, so there's an interesting reciprocation that way as well. So um, I really try to be careful as an applique artist. Um, I do a lot with photography. Yeah. Um, I, I look at a lot of photos. Um, I have created a lot of patterns by drawing line work, by taking three or four. I'm going to use one example recently. And I'm actually kind of interested in your opinion as yeah. a law professor. Yeah. I took four different images that I found on the internet that were all different coral reef scenes yeah. and a shark. I blended those pictures together in, yeah. in Photoshop, we'll say, even though it wasn't Photoshop. Yeah. People will know that, like the concept. Yeah. Then I, I took that and I started drawing lines on top of that. I yeah. started drawing the pieces and parts that I wanted to create, and that became my reef shark applique pattern. Yeah. So, you know, at what point is that somebody else's? It was their photography. Right. Yes, but I was drawing the line and I changed the lines. Right. And, and you I were used... taking com- little parts of it so that you weren't taking their entire, you weren't taking a photog. So if you took a, a f- photograph and just like replicated it, Courts don't aren't super keen on that, but taking component right. bits of pieces of it, um, people are pretty okay with it. Um, yeah, you know, there's I a lot a collage, of law about which, that, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, it's so for me, I draw the line with how would I feel if somebody did it to me? That's right. You know, like if if so if I go on the internet and somebody's selling a Bengal tiger quilt pattern, yeah, and it's almost identical to my quilt pattern, but all they've done is change the colors and the packaging. Right. You know what? That actually just happened with my shark, and yeah. it it really frustrated me because it was slightly changed. So the design, the body of the design on the shark itself was changed slightly. Yeah. Uh, just enough to get away from the copyright. Uh huh. Is this but the one that you patented the shark that the shark tool or a shark? Yes. The shark tool. No, no. Oh, I'm sorry. That's funny. How funny. I just mentioned yeah. the reef shark. Yeah. Yeah. No, uh, my shark rotary cutter. Yeah. So, right. And so if uh, whoever holds that patent, if you do, or if you've licensed it to Missouri Star, they can then sort of make a decision of like what part was patentable. Is right. it infringing the patent? 
Do they send a cease right. and desist letter? Do they get a licensing agreement from them? Because they right. can do that to say you're right. actually using something patentable and we're right. happy for you to do that as long as you license right. that technology. Right. 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 Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So for me, the concept was I wanted to bring a 14 millimeter rotary cutter to the market for cutting freestyle apples. Yeah. It looks so really are, cool. Are, right. It's radical. So technically there are now four tools that I'm aware of that hold a 14 millimeter blade. My shark apple cutter the one that I call the knockoff. And then there are two that are completely different. Yeah. They were just the same handle from the other manufacturers reduced in size to hold a 14 millimeter. That makes sense. Yeah. The one that makes me feel frustrated. See, the man does this back to how it would make me feel right. at the end of the day. They didn't improve upon my design. They even use the exact same bullet points on their packaging that we have on our packaging. Really? That's so not cool. When, when I went to Olfa, yeah. Six or seven years ago and said, I think we could do a smaller rotary cutter. They said, it's impossible. Yeah. And I said, no, it is. It's possible. They said, no, we don't, we're a distributor. We actually don't make anything. There is, it's, it is possible, but we don't do this for you. Yeah. And I said, great. They said, but you should do it on your own. I said, great. So I went out and did it on my own. And so I took an Ulfa 18 millimeter tool that I was using and I changed the handle. I put a 14 millimeter. I changed the way that the phone, you know, all the right. different things to make it fit my need yeah make it fit my grip make it fit my handle get a better safety for the arthritic folks and all the things i was after yeah so i improved upon a design in my opinion right but the the folks that basically just bent the handle they didn't they actually made it worse in my opinion they went pat they they, they took my design and they did it the opposite direction interesting and, and and it was only a design change so that they could sell a tool that they really had nothing. So they basically, I feel like they stole it from. Yeah, them. they stole it, and that's a terrible feeling, right? That that feels yeah. there's something about it that is um, kind of primal. That you're yeah. like, wait a second, like that's what I created, a kind of very lucky and like this was my labor. I thought of this, and now you've yeah. kind of taken it from me. Yeah, this was my kid's college fund, and it was, and, and unfortunately, it's it, it was a smart move on their part. And again, it's like I created a hammer or a flathead screwdriver. This yeah. is a tool. And of course, how many different rotary cutters do we have out there that hold right. a 45 millimeter head? Right. Oh, yeah. There, I think there's at least seven popular brands. And then I won't even tell you how many there are if you were to actually Crazy. Google it. I mean, it, yeah. it's ridiculous. So it's one of those situations when I'm designing a project, I do everything in my power to make sure it's as my own as possible. Or it's so simple that I'm teaching a simple technique that yeah. would be usable for all the other quilt That's teachers just out right. there. That's just right. That's not protected. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. so maybe another quilt teacher could say, oh, gosh, if you're struggling with how to cut or how to make the seams uh, to follow my pattern, have you seen my friend Rob's video? You can check right. this out. Exactly. It's completely unrelated, but it has this exact technique. This yeah. would be great. Like, let's support each other out there. Yeah. That's what I think it should be all about. Now, when you're creating a project, this is one thing I'm really curious about. When you're making a yeah. project, now that you're with Missouri Star... Do you, because at the bottom, at least, so I, when I was watching them, that you had sort of pr- pr- uh, the products for the project that you're doing. Does the, yes. the how, what's the order? So do they, do you like, do you have like a whole bunch of different fabric or things and then you like, okay, well, I'm going to use this thing. Like, how do you coordinate of like your creativity and what you're choosing to use so that it, they can sell the the stuff at Missouri Star? Um, well, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a three-part coin. Okay. Three, three-sided coin. Yeah. The first and most important is uh, neither Jenny or I will put anything in front of the camera that we do not believe in 100%. Cool. So we have a rule that, and this is what I was taught on day one, we only show what we love okay. because we sell what we show. Right. So we have to love it. We have to believe in it in order for you to see it on the camera. Okay. Therefore, when I design a quilt, I design two ways. I design like a person would when they walk into a quilt shop. Oh, I found this pre-cut. I'm in love with it. What yeah. am I going to make? Right. Right. Reaction. Totally. And this leads right. to I must make something with this. Right. Yeah. Now, yeah. unfortunately, because I'm a designer and I learned how to keep notes and stuff, I have four or five recipe cards that are, yeah. you know, I've got like, I've got bins in my closet that I have built. I have an 18 bin system in my closet. Each bin is a project. And sometimes it will be just an idea. It'll be a, a dummy block that I put there. And when the right pre-cut arrives, boom, that goes in that bin and that it's falls really cool. into my queue. Yeah. Because the, th- the third so- problem or the third side of my coin is that we're on a calendar. Because I film every eight weeks. I try to film roughly 10 tutorials at a time in case there's ever a hiccup or a bump. Right. 
my fabric has to arrive then in my studio technically another 10 weeks before I film. Right. 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 But it may not release for 10 weeks after I film it. So it's a 20 week turnaround. Wow. That's crazy. On supplies. And we are, thank you for everybody that's listening, the number one seller in fabric. Right. So Missouri Star sells more fabric than anybody. So my, my warehouse is the hardest to keep stock. Yeah. So it arrives, I fall in love with it, and so does everybody else. Yeah. And it's gone before my tutorial airs. So are you then so, looking at market for things that look interesting to you? Like how are you choosing that fab? Or is it like how are you – I guess Missouri Star no. is also getting – no, you – how are you, yeah. how are you finding that? Like, I'm confused. Tell me what, more. Yeah, about yeah, yeah, the process. yeah. What I do now is I have, I have learned, I create ideas that are not so fabric dependent. Got it. Then when I get ready to go and start to write up my proposal for 10 new project, I get our quarterly buying report where our, our buyers have put a beautiful slideshow together Got of it. everything they're, they're, they're excited about. And then you in. can choose it for that pattern, that pat that yep. thing. And then if it's not in that, then I take to the buyers and say, I want to make this. And um, it, I, I would really like black and white. And I wish it was in batik, but you know how hard white is. And then they say, no, 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 no. Island Batik just made a that's beautiful great. white, all white batik. Let's use that. And then so that starts the whole that's project. That's great. And so because Missouri Star does the videos in many ways to sell the fabric because the videos are free. Their business yes. model is if you can sort of help people imagine what to do with this fabric and they and it's and it was the pre-cut model of yes. like if you you help people figure out how to use the pre-cuts, they'll buy the pre-cuts kind of thing. Yes. And they, and they will generally buy them from us because we have our wonderful daily deals and our, our discounted shipping and all the stuff we right, do. All that stuff. And, and, yeah. and it's an experience. And the, and the kids that started Missouri Star Quilt Company are tech. Their internet, they live on the internet. Yeah. And and they wanted the internet experience to be user friendly and and Jenny Doan, you know, you talk to her. She is yeah. vanilla cookies. I mean, yeah, she she, she is. is as wonderful in person. She's actually twice as wonderful in person as she is on the internet because you really get to interact and laugh yeah. and hug her and, and she's just an amazing person. But but that's the business model. Yeah, she, she makes you feel comfortable. And then when you need the supplies, because it went so well to make another one, you go back and buy from us because yeah. It's this reciprocation and it, and it's worked very, very well. So cool. You know, it, it's very really, really, yeah, it is neat. So for me, yeah, that's part of the designing process is like keeping within the, the reins and I've learned, um, but yeah, but Monday I put out a tutorial based on my seascape and it was very fabric dependent. And I had to wait till I found a wonderful tropical fish print that I wanted to cut up for applique. And then we had to time it so that that quilt was released. And then they also have a reorder. They actually have, I think, two people that just reorder all day. Wow. And so they will um, watch those things. And as my tutorial is getting ready to release, they'll go ahead and they'll say, oh, we have so much in the warehouse. Amazing. We need so much more. And so we have a pretty pretty efficient team of uh, people doing things that are, you know, talented individuals. You're so cool. I love it. Your Thank life you. is Thank cool. You. you just got it. Oh, like, I am you so know. blessed. I'm awesome. so glad. Um, it's, well, before it's fun you... to share on this side of on on this side of the coin, no? Yeah. Okay. What well, I have to tell you, I put out that you were going to be on the call, and I have someone. So I have to tell you what people said first. Um, Sue Donnelly, who is, we have a Facebook group. Uh, we call ourselves a Quilting Army. That was the booth, right? So we have a bunch of people. Oh, so I told them I'll that you were check coming. That out. I... Yeah. So it's on Facebook, and we have all kinds of people on it. So everybody has everybody. It's like it's a great space of like. Famous people and industry people and regular people and everybody's on it. So it's called Just Want a Quilt and it's a group. So um, so Sa- Sandra uh, Hubley, oh no, no, sorry. Uh, Sue Donnelly said, please share that his weighted blanket directions helped me, f- um, helped a very special baby to sleep. Oh yeah, that's been a really popular video. Hugely, people, right? Yeah, yeah, I love that. That was, that was really good video. Good video. I liked it. Yeah, that was pretty awesome. So there's also a fidget quilt for those folks that like ah. projects that, that are good for maybe our, our seniors. Yeah, and, and right. That kind of stuff. Right, cool. Um, Seth Hackler, who's um, uh, quilting yeah, on a budget. Yeah. You know Seth? He said you, yeah. well, you not tell personally, him. Personally, I know of Seth. I don't know him personally. Yeah, he's yeah. great. He's amazing. He's been so, yeah. he's awesome. I love Seth. Um, he said you yeah, have to tell him. Promoting. He said, you have to tell him that as a guy quilter, he was the first guy I came across that quilted that showed me I wasn't the only guy that liked to quilt. Um, and that, that meant a lot. Um, and then there's just a lot of people who just adore you, but I wanted to share those two with you you. that they, 
They really think you are awesome. And so do I. I think you're awesome too. Well, I think you're awesome. So well, this is you. great. Yeah. Well, it's an incredibly good life I have. I think it's an incredibly good life we all have. Yeah. You know, if I could send a little message out there, I think it's, especially with the holidays and things coming up, I just, um, or maybe this is going to air later. I don't know. No, yeah. But, no, um, we'll, we'll, yeah. Go ahead. I just, let's not all take ourselves so seriously. Anymore. Yeah. You know, like, like let's give ourselves a little hall pass to just be less than perfect. And um, totally. And, yeah. and enjoy the comedy in the less than perfection, because I, I know that's been a nice pressure release valve for me. It's let a lot of pressure out of my life. I just, stop trying so hard and it doesn't mean I don't want my stuff to be great and I don't want people to love what I do and I don't want to you know support my family and quilting but I just don't want to lose my mind trying yeah to get there. no and that's really important I like your now any other suggestions because you've been on this journey of um calmness and sort of any last sort of I so for some of us who are not quite at we're not in the crying in the crying on the on the path but I'm there I'm getting right. there right. um but right. also how to like make your day better. Any, any last thoughts about that? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think we have to let go yeah. each, of something each day because uh, yeah, let, let go of ourselves. Like, again, you know, yeah. not take ourselves so seriously, but, but literally because we now have the internet in our pocket, yeah, uh, we believe we can do more than we can do. It's true. At one point in the human race, we basically got up, with the sun and went to bed with the sun. It's true. And, and in that period of time, we did everything in our power to feed ourselves, stay warm, and maybe get some water. Yeah. You know, and, and being a, an outdoorsy backpacker kind of guy, I love that, I love that concept of backpacking. It's like all day long, all I'm going to do is walk and yeah. eat. And, and so I love all the things we can do in a day. But, you know, so my story is two days ago, I was running around. We had just too many things scheduled. Yeah. And I was freaking out because it was more <laughs> than I wanted to do. Yeah. And my wife said to me, she says, "Hun, I've already told you, I can take this pressure off of you. I can do this that will help both of us. Yeah. Pressure's gone. Yeah. Let it go. Like, yeah. not only have you given up the physical problem that was the too much in your day the yeah. one too many things you know they say the straw that breaks the camel's back yeah but 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 secondly then realizing and stepping back and going okay okay now stop ranting and raving about it because because yeah. the pressure is going to be gone right. you don't have that responsibility in six hours from now don't spend the next five hours and 59 minutes worrying about it <laughs> it's you're, so true you know your, your partner's <laughs> so got true. it trust that, trust that it's, that it's that's gonna, right Trust. That's right. Letting yeah, go, give, letting other people do stuff is a good thing. Yeah. Well, yeah. this is awesome. I really have enjoyed yeah, our time together. Um, oh, I would I love you to come back. So like we're we're not All really right. like a we're like a community. So like when you feel like it and you want to tell us more about how we should li help us live our lives in a more reasonable way, come back. It would be great. Oh, good. Be because yeah. we spent most of today on, on the, I was supposed to be introducing myself and I just went on and on and on. So next time we'll get through the rest of the introductions. And totally. That's right. I mean, we got to like two of them, so that's good. So we'll just have to come back. That's, that happens a lot, actually. <laughs> You're yeah, not the I first guest. I warned you guest. I was long-winded. Yeah, no, I, but I, I think warned you. I'd talk your ear off. What I really liked about the conversation, because, you know, I did, I watched a lot of video, I watched your videos and I watched interviews with you and I didn't really want, I mean, if people want to know like your story in that traditional way. They, there's plenty out there, but I really liked what we talked about because I think that that you. what you're saying is what everybody everybody's feeling this pressure of too much right now um at just the way of our world and I think I like that idea of letting go of letting go of things of letting go of pressure um and sort of thinking making a, a more thoughtful choice I think that's really good hey I think I just came up with a new tagline yeah okay we got something along the lines of let it go and pick something up that's meaning nice. like like let go of that worry and pick up something tactile. So that's great. Wrap up our you should totally do that. I think you should be doing videos that are about like lifestyle stuff. I think you should be doing a, a podcast. You could do a podcast, but you you should be talking more about lifestyle stuff. You've got stuff to I've say. You know, I've been practicing. Okay, you're seeing me on video. Yeah. I've been practicing this look in the morning. Yeah. Uh, this is of uh, the first thing in the morning look. Uh -huh. um, I I would I'm interested in maybe like just that little. 90 second like on instagram live every morning or monday through friday just 
a word of the day. You a know, word of the day. Inspiration for the day. Yeah. This is my little mantra for the day. Okay. And so I practiced doing it for about a week internally and sending it around to the, the my team at Missouri Star and stuff. Yeah. It's pretty fun. So I'm not sure if we're going to start off January that way, but I would, I would like to because. The more I talk about my story, the more it helps me personally as yeah. well. You know, and I think that's right. part of it. We have to we have to remember we're not out there alone. We're not, no, we're not. this alone, you know? We're not. There's a, there's and I think it's great. Well if you do that, come will you come back and talk about it? I would love if sure. you if you do that project, come talk to us come tell us about it. Cause I think um, and I wanna I wanna hear your word. I wanna I'll try it. I will totally try it. I am an over uh, I, somebody said, um uh, they gave me a t-shirt that said something like, I teach, I quilt, I over schedule. <laughs> right. Nice. <laughs> totally. Yes, I do. <laughs> yes, yes, I do. Wow. <laughs> anyway. Again, we, we are not alone. <laughs> <laughs> you are wonderful. I had such a nice time chatting with you today. So you've been listening to Just Want a Quilt, a research podcast coming out of Tulane University Law School. And I'm Elizabeth Townsend Gar. If you like this podcast, keep listening. Also, we have a Facebook group. Come join us. We talk about a lot of things. We also have an Instagram account. And of course, most importantly, I really hope you get a chance to quilt today. 